rejoice on thee, my Savior and my God. Well, may this glowing heart rejoice and tell its raptures all abroad. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch and pray and live rejoicing every day. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. Oh, happy bond that seals my vows to him who marries all my love. That cheerful anthems fill this house, while to that sacred shrine I move. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to wash and pray. Rejoicing every day, happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. Tis done the great transactions done. I am my Lord's and He is mine. He drew me and I followed on, charmed to confess the voice divine. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch and pray and live rejoicing every day. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. Now rest my long divided heart, fixed on this bliss will send to rest. Nor ever from my Lord depart, with him of every good possessed. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch and pray, and live rejoicing every day. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. Take your Bible this morning for our scripture reading, if you would please, to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. Are you warm this morning? Is anybody warm? Good. I'm burning up, so. I feel like I'm in the Philippines again, but uh, not, not quite that bad. But uh, we're uh, endeavoring to get some cool air coming, so. Exodus 19, we're going to read verses 10 through 18, and we read the verses responsively. We begin together on verse 10, then I read verse 11, together on verse 12, and alternating till we end together on verse 18 of Exodus chapter 19. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing pleased to read God's word, and let's begin together on verse number 10. Ready? And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. And be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves, that ye go not up into the mount, or touch the border of it, Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. There shall not an hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether he be be- whether it be beast or man. It shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the, the people, Be ready against the third day, come not at your wives. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. 
and let's pray together, shall we? Father, we bow before you in prayer now, ask you to add your blessing to the reading of the scripture here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the Bible. Thank you, God, for giving us your words and preserving them for us, that we hold copies of them in our hand this morning. And Lord, we're asking you to continue to make our hearts ready to receive your word today. Thank you for the music already we've enjoyed and the fellowship together. And Lord, we're praying that you'll bless the special and that, Lord, you'll help us to focus our, our entire attention, mind, body, soul, all of our strength on what you would want to say to us this morning. And so, Lord, that our heart would be good soil that the word of God could fall into and bring forth fruit in our life. So help us today, Lord, and bless the special to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. The preachers are weary, the singers are tired, the church as we know it is losing its fire. Some are discouraged from bearing the load, but we must determine to keep pressing on. Cause if just one more soul were to walk down the aisle, it would be worth every struggle, it would be worth every mile. A lifetime of labor is still worth it all if it rescues just one more soul. So preachers keep preaching and singers go sing. Laymen keep sharing that Jesus is King. The angels have gathered, they're surrounding the throne. And they'll start rejoicing for just one more soul. Cause if just one more soul were to walk down the aisle, it would be worth every struggle, it would be worth every mile. A lifetime of labor is still worth it all if it rescues just one more soul cause if just one more soul were to walk down the aisle it would be worth every struggle it would be worth every mile a lifetime of labor is still worth it all if it rescues just one more soul. Amen. That's good. Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer this morning. We thank you, Lord, for, again, the opportunity for us to gather together here. Thank you, Lord, again, that we have opportunity to open up your word. I pray that the Spirit of God would speak to our hearts this morning. That, Lord, you would help me as I bring the message today to be clear and concise. Lord, help the people to listen carefully. Spirit of God, be the teacher today and help us to understand your word and grasp the truth that you have for us this morning and how important it is and how vital it is that we have an audience with God. And so, Lord, bless the preaching of your word during this hour. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen you'll bear with me a little bit, got home, and, and whatever this stuff is that goes around, I got it, and uh, so I'll try to, I hope it's not too much of a bother to you to listen to uh, this morning. Um, I want to talk to you this morning on this subject, an audience with God, an audience with God. It's been three months in Exodus 19 uh, since <clears throat> the people of Israel has left, have left Egypt. The Red Sea, the drowning of the Egyptian army in the Red Sea is behind them. God has led them, God has protected them, pillar of fire by night, a pillar of cloud by day. And now God talks to Moses, and he tells Moses, I want to meet with the people. I want to talk to them, and I, I want to let them know that I talk to you. 
and I want them to follow you and to believe in you. Notice verse 9. The Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. And so God, God says, here's what, I, here's what you need to do. Uh, there needs to be some preparation made for the people to have an audience with God. He said, you have to sanctify the people, set them apart. You've got to wash their clothes. Uh, they're, they're not to come at their wives, uh, not to have any relations. And, and there, there, there's going to be a barrier set up around the bottom of the mountain. Uh, no one's going to pass that barrier. If, they, if they, someone goes through and they touch the mountain or they approach the mountain, God says, then they'll be killed. Just like that. Uh, it was a fearful and terrible thing that was going to happen. The, the Bible says all of Mount Sinai was on a smoke. It doesn't mean it was at a cigarette. Uh, it means God came down in fire and the whole place was smoking and the whole place was hot. It was a thunders and lightnings and the, the, the earth shook. You can imagine the, 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 the fear that would be in the hearts of people for God had come down to talk to them and to have an audience with God. Now you understand something. It was a fearful and terrible thing for them. It is not to be a fearful and terrible thing for us to have an audience with God. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, the Bible says the veil in the temple that separated where God's, God's presence was in the temple from where no one could enter in except the high priest one time a year, that veil was torn in two from the top to the bottom. God opening the way down to man. And now, <clears throat> the Bible says, because of Jesus Christ and His blood that was shed on the cross, we can come boldly to the throne of grace. We come boldly into the presence of God that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. All of us have the ability, as believers in Jesus Christ, as Christians, we have an audience with God. We have the ability to come into His presence. We have an ability to be able to talk with Him and meet with Him. Jesus, when He taught in the Sermon on the Mount, He didn't say, if you pray. He said, when you pray. He, he expected that we would desire to talk to God. We would desire to want to have an audience with God. We would desire to want to meet with Him. And it's not a fearful thing. There's no thunderings and quakes and, and, and fire and smoke and a threat of being killed if we get too close. No, now God says, draw nigh to me and I'll draw nigh to you. God says, draw near in Hebrews with full assurance of faith. He says, I want you to draw near to me. And He desires that we be near to Him. I'm going to tell you in a day of instability and insecurity and terrorism, we need an audience with God. In a day of drug overdoses and opioid epidemic, we need an audience with God. In a day of corruption and immorality and dishonesty, we need an audience with God. In a day when people laugh at holiness and laugh at godliness and faithfulness, we need an audience with God. Oh, there ought to be some people that say, I want to come boldly to the throne of grace. And I want to obtain mercy. And I want to find grace to help in time of need. Oh, there ought to be some people that say, I desire and I want to have a passion to have an audience with God. I want to meet with Him. I want to know God. You see, for them to go into God's presence, they had to wash their clothes. They had to set themselves apart from any, any physical relations with their mates. And, and they had to stay on the perimeter of the mountain. There were certain things they had to do to meet with God. And there's three things that we must settle in order to have an audience with God. Uh, you, you can't just meet with God because you want to. Uh, there's some requirements you have to fulfill to meet with God, to have an audience with God. Three things must be settled. Number one, salvation must be settled. Salvation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to who? Cometh to the Father but by me. 
Now, we use that, and rightfully so, as salvation, that you won't come to God and receive eternal life unless you come through Jesus Christ. But the truth is, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5 says there's one mediator between God and man, God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. There's only one person that mediates between you and me and God, and that's Jesus Christ. If you're going to come to God, not only for salvation, but also for prayer, you have to come through Jesus Christ. And listen, prayer is for the Christian. Prayer is for the believer. Uh, prayer is, now I'm not saying that an unsaved person can never have their prayers answered. There are instances in the Bible where God in His mercy answered prayer. Uh, when the, the, the men on the ship wanted to know who was causing the problem, uh, they, they prayed, they cast lots, and they knew it was Jonah. Uh, when Cornelius wasn't saved, but he was praying for guidance, God answered Cornelius' prayer, even though he was not saved. But that is God's mercy. God is not obligated to answer uh, any prayer of one who does not know Him. You can pray as a lost person, but you have no confidence that God will answer your prayer. But when you pray as a believer, when you pray as someone who knows Jesus Christ, you can pray with confidence that God will hear and God will answer your prayer. And you have confidence in prayer. There is a great difference in saying prayers and praying. Don't just say prayers. Don't just open up a book and read a prayer. Pray. Pray. Pray and ask God for what you need. And pray and ask God for the things that are on your heart. But you have to settle the fact of salvation. Are you saved? So, oh, I don't think I need to be saved. Well, we have a problem. Okay? Because, you know, soon uh, it'll be the, the Christmas season where we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. The angels announce that day, unto you is born this day in the city of David a, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. If you don't need to be saved, if we don't need to be saved, why did God send a Savior? If God thought we needed to be saved, then I think I'll agree with God. I, you wouldn't mind if I said, I think God's right and you're wrong. Would that be okay with you? Okay. If there's, a, if, there's a, if there's two sides and God's on one side and you're on the other, I'm going to take God's side. Okay. And uh, that's just the way it's going to be. Because God's never been wrong yet. And uh, though you may think you never have been, I, I would probably talk to your spouse and get that settled. But we're, we're talking about salvation. Talking about needing to be saved. And everybody needs to be saved. There's no other name given among men, under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. Uh, that's salvation. That's a good word. That's a Bible word. And you and I need to be saved. And Jesus Christ is salvation. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about getting baptized. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about keeping the commandments. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. Have you ever called on Jesus and asked Him to be your personal Savior? Have you ever called on Jesus and asked Him to save you from your sin? That's salvation. 1 John, 1, 12, 1 John 5 and verse 12, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Okay, Pretty simple, isn't it? If you have the Son of God and you have Him as your Savior, you have eternal life. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have eternal life. You can be just... Listen, yet salvation is not a hope so thing. It's not I think so. It's not I'm wishing so. It's not I just believe I will. It is I know so proposition. You know that you're saved or you know that you're lost. It's not an in-between thing. I could come to any of you this morning and I'd say, Christian, let me ask you a question. Are you married? Are you sure? Huh? Yeah, you're pretty sure about that? Yeah? Okay. Your parents are glad to know that too. Right. Yeah. He knows whether he's married or not. Fred Messer, are you married? Yes, he is. Huh. You didn't, you'd have to say, I, guess, I think so, I hope so, I guess so. You know whether you are or not. Well, then the same thing's true about are you saved? Do you have eternal life? That's not a hope so, I think so. That's a no so. That's yes or no. And if you don't, it's very, very simple the way God put it in the Bible to become a Christian. And that is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. To trust Him alone as your Savior. To forgive your sins. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord 
shall be saved. You call on the Lord Jesus and you trust Him as your Savior. There's no in-between. You're saved or you're lost. Settle the salvation issue. Trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's that simple. It's, hey, I'm glad it's simple. I don't, I, if I have the choice between something hard or something easy, I'll take easy. Okay? I'm okay with that. And the Lord made it as simple as receiving a gift. And you receive His gift of eternal life. So we settle the salvation issue. The second thing that needs to be settled if you're going to have an audience with God is the sin issue. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 1 John 3 and verse 4, that sin is a transgression of the law. Sin is where you violate God's law. That's why the Bible says all of us have sinned. We've all done things that God says we should not do. We've all violated God's law at some point. Whether we've done something that God says we shouldn't do, or we've not done some things that God says we ought to do. Those are what we call sins of commission, when we commit things that we know God doesn't want us to do, or omission, things we've not done that God says we ought to do. But all have sinned. There is none righteous, no, not one. And so we all are sin have sinned in the sight of God. Now, I'm saved. I have been forgiven of my sins by Jesus Christ. I read the Bible. I'm at salvation and dwelt by the Spirit of God. And that's why when I read the Bible, I can understand the Bible. When someone who's lost without the Holy Spirit reads the Bible, they have no way to understand the Bible. They are spiritually discerned, the Bible says. They don't have the the Spirit of God... By the way, holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. And so the Holy Ghost is the one who inspired men to write the Bible. He gave them God's words. So in essence, the author of the Bible lives inside of you and me. And so when you read the Bible, he's the one that helps you understand the Bible. So when you say, I just don't understand this, rather than just call somebody up and say, what does this mean? Or what is this talking about? Why don't you first ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand his word? And ask for His guidance. In fact, before you read, you ought to say, Holy Spirit, help me understand your word today. Uh, uh, Open up the word of God to me. Open my understanding. And He helps me understand what I read. Paul wrote that it's by the law came the knowledge of sin. So as I read the Bible, as a believer, I I become aware of ways I've violated God's law. I become aware of ways I've sinned against God. I, 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 it, it, God brings that to my knowledge. God brings it to light in my life. Now, notice some scripture with me, will you please? We'll look at Psalm 66. The 66th Psalm, please. Are you cooling off? You feel better in here? Good. Despite the hot air, you're, you're cooling off. Good. Psalm 66. Notice verse with me, verse number 18, would you please? Psalm 66 and verse 18. (coughs) If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You see, not only do I have to settle salvation, I have to settle something about sin. If I'm regarding iniquity in my heart, if I'm acknowledging, if I'm, you know, when I'm treating it kindly, I'm not. When sometimes we used to say this, people don't say it much anymore. I don't think. I say you'll see somebody if if I saw Danny Wright and his wife wasn't with him. Uh, sometimes you'd say, "Well, give my regards to Bobby." See what he's saying is that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Hey, Pastor said hello. Pastor said to give him to give you his regards. In other words, I'm I'm acknowledging that, and it's a good acknowledgement. And God says, if I'm giving that good acknowledgement to iniquity in my heart, God says, I'm not going to listen to you when you pray. You won't have an audience with God. God says, I'll turn my ear away from listening to you. Because you're regarding iniquity. You're regarding iniquity in your heart. Look at Proverbs 28. He reiterates this, this principle in Proverbs 28 and verse 9. Proverbs 28 and verse number 9. Notice here, the Bible says, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be, what church? 
What's that? Abomination. God says, you turn your ear away from hearing the law. You turn your ear away from hearing my word. And God says, your prayer will be an abomination to me. An abomination is something that is extremely hateful. It, it even goes beyond hate. It's, it's something that God would extremely despise. God says, I, I have no desire. In fact, I don't just have no desire to listen. He says, I hate the fact you're even praying because you won't listen to me. That's an amazing thing. And, and don't look at me strange. I'm just the messenger. I'm just reading what, what the book says. That's what the Bible teaches. So don't, hey, how important is it not to turn... Well, I know the Bible says, but... Well, Pastor, I know the Bible says this, but the way I see it... And so we, 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 we phrase things that way, but what we're really saying is, I don't agree with God. And we turn away our ear from hearing His Word. And so it's important to listen to the Word of God. Look at Isaiah 59 with me, please. Isaiah chapter 59. We're saying to have an audience with God, you have to settle the salvation issue. You have to settle the sin issue. The Bible says in Isaiah 59 verse 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither His ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. That's pretty plain. God is saying if, if you regard iniquity in your heart, if you have sin in your life that you refuse to confess to Him and forsake, God says, I will not hear you when you pray. And none of us can afford to go through life and not have God hear us when we pray. None of us can afford to go and, and take on the issues of life without having an audience with God. So, what do I do with sin? Well, the Bible makes it very clear. We, number one, confess sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, the word confessor isn't just to confess it, but it is to agree with God about our sin. In other words, we're going to say the same thing about our sin that God does. Well, you know, I don't think what I do is that bad. What does God say about it? You see, we, we tend to, 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 to think, well, it's not that bad what I'm doing. But no, we have to agree with God. That's why number one principle in our Reformers Unanimous Addictions Recovery Program is if God's against it, so am I. In other words, whatever God says is wrong, is wrong. I can't justify it. I can't dress it up. I can't make it sound okay. I can't tolerate it. I can't say, well, it's acceptable. I'm not as bad as I used to be, so it's okay if I keep these sins. No, no, God says, if it's wrong, it's wrong. And I have to agree with God about that. And I have to confess it to Him. <coughs> and then He's faithful and just to forgive me of my sin. Why do I confess my sin? With, listen, all my sins were paid for when, I, when Jesus died on the cross. All your sins were paid for. Past, present, and future. Okay? So you say, why do we confess our sin? So we can have an audience with God. Because our sin, unconfessed sin, separates us from God. We confess that sin because I want to have an audience with God. I want the fellowship with God. We have to walk in the light as He is in the light and we have fellowship one with another. If I walk in darkness, I'm walking in sin. And so, I want to confess my sin. Now, go back to Proverbs 28, would you please? Something else I want you to see when it regards to sin. I need to confess my sins. And by the way, you don't confess your sin to somebody else. You don't confess your sin to a preacher or to a priest. You confess your sin to God. Uh, there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. You confess to Him. That's who you confess to. You don't need to confess to others uh, about your sin. You confess your sin to God because He's the only one who is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin. All right? And He'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now, look at Proverbs 28. And verse number 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. 
Here, the Bible says that now we don't just confess our sin, but we're willing to forsake our sin. And we will receive mercy. So I not only confess sin, I must forsake my sin. I must leave it. When I, I, must, I must not allow it to stay with me. Okay? I, have to, I have to kick it out of the house. Okay? Uh, Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That means He'll stay with you forever. When I forsake something means I abandon it. I leave it alone. I stay away from it. I have to put it out of my life. When the woman came who was taking adultery and Jesus wrote in the sand and all the men began to disperse. Remember what Jesus told the woman? She said, uh, He said, Hath no man condemned you? And she said, Well, no man, Lord. And He said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He was saying, You're forgiven. You've confessed it. Now forsake it. And don't go do it anymore. Forsake your sin. Forsake it. And don't, don't cover your sin because you, you have to see it as a great offense to God. God, see it as the, the thing that nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. Well, put Christ on the cross. You say, oh, those Roman soldiers. No, it was my sin and your sin that nailed Jesus to the cross. All my iniquities on Him were laid. See, he, is, he bore the iniquities of us all. It was my sin that nailed Him to the cross. It was your sin that nailed Him to the cross. We have to see that it was our sin that put Him there. And so we, only when we confess our sin and we forsake our sin will we conquer our sin. You leave it around. Most of you know this. If, if, you're, trying to, if you're trying to quit a, a bad habit, if you're trying to uh, not eat certain foods. You have to not have those foods around to get. You understand? If I if I decide okay, I gotta I gotta get on my strict diet and I gotta drop some some weight. I told my Sunday school class I've given up trying to lose weight. I'm gonna concentrate on getting taller, and uh, it may work just as well. <laughs> and uh, and but you know then then what I can't do is I can't keep my stash of Oreos in different places. You see. And we keep them around there. Some of you, some of you, you know, you know, some of you have battled cigarettes and you want to quit cigarettes. You know what happened? You keep a few around just in secret places that when you really need one, you know where to go. And you don't quit that way, do you? No. And you don't lose weight that way either. Okay? And so you understand, because I've confessed, but I don't forsake. I have to I have to abandon it. And I have to put up the boundaries not to allow that back in. See? That's important. And when I do that, God says, you'll have mercy. I'll give you my mercy. I'll help you. And you know what You know what the greatest thing is? Then I get an audience with God. I don't, uh, my, my sin doesn't separate me from God. If I guard a nuclear heart, the Lord doesn't hear me. I don't know about you. I want God to hear me. I want God to hear me when I pray. You know, I'm not going to be the pastor I need to be if I can't pray. And God doesn't hear me. I can't be the husband I need to be if I can't pray and God doesn't hear me. I can't be the, 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 the father I need to be if I can't pray and God doesn't hear me. I can't be the Christian I need to be if I don't pray and God doesn't hear me. So, so we have to settle the salvation issue and you have to settle the sin issue. And then, number three, you have to settle the service issue. The service issue. I want you to turn with me to 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel 15, we have the instance of Saul, the first king of Israel. And Saul started out real well. Humble. When they, when they went to get him to anoint him, he was hiding. He didn't, he didn't really want the spotlight. He didn't really, he didn't really want the job. And, 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 and he started out pretty good. God, through Samuel, his prophet, gives Saul an assignment in chapter 15. Notice with me verse 1. <coughs> Excuse me. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. 
Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not. But slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. So God gives the instruction here to Saul through Samuel. You're going to go attack the Amalekites and basically you're going to utterly destroy what? All. Everything. All means all. That's all all means. Okay? So you're, you're going to destroy everything. That's the command. He gathers the army together in the next few verses. Verse 7. Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. Uh-oh. I don't remember God telling him to do that, do you? And utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, that they utterly destroyed. Let me ask you a question. Did he obey God? Oh, he sure didn't, did he? He, the, he got into the thing, and whether it's him, whether it's the people, thinking, man, these things are too good to, to go to waste. Man, surely we could keep some of this stuff. What was the problem? That's not what God said. That isn't what the Lord told him to do. So God came to Samuel, verse 10. Then came the word of the Lord to Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, he cried unto the Lord all night. When Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul cometh come to Carmel. And behold, he set him up a place, and has gone about and passed on, and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul. Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. You know what that's called? Lying. Lying to yourself. When he, when, he, when he hadn't performed it. And Samuel says, What meaneth then the bleeding of the sheep in mine ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep <coughs> and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Oh, we didn't obey God, but we're going to sacrifice these to God. So that makes it okay. Doesn't it? <laughs> no, I guess it doesn't. Notice what Samuel said to Saul. Stay, I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he saith unto him, Say on. Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, and, and wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel, and the Lord sent thee on a journey, and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but did fly upon the spoil, and did evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and I have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and I brought Agag the king of the Amalekites, and I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And then this great verse, Samuel said, At the Lord is great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Saul, Saul knew what God wanted him to do, and he refused to do it. And he was rejected by God. He wouldn't be received by God. So, well, Pastor, what's that got to do with me? Has God told you to do something and you're refusing to do it? Boy, that's quiet. Has God prompted your heart to do something and you're saying, no, God, I'm not going to do that? Amen. Is God prompting your heart about being a witness and being a soul winner, giving the gospel to others? You refuse to do it? 
God, God been speaking to your heart about teaching Sunday school? And you're telling God no? God spoke to your heart about singing in the choir or working in children's church or helping in the nursery or maybe tithing of your income? And you're telling God all the reasons why you can't do that? Why you cannot do what God's telling you to do? Unwilling Christians do not pray. Unwilling Christians do not pray. When you're disobedient to what God wants you to do, you don't pray. Let's talk about Jonah. Most of you are familiar with that story. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh to preach against their sins, and Jonah, no. He went down, got on a ship, went the opposite direction. And, and you know, remember the story? A big, God sent a big storm. And, and the sailors did all they could. They were throwing stuff overboard. Trying to lighten the load of the ship. They didn't, they didn't know what else to do. And finally, finally they had to go down and they had to get Jonah. What was Jonah doing? Sleeping. He wasn't praying. They're up there crying out to God, whatever God they knew existed. Whatever God, they, they're calling on their gods. They didn't know what else to do, but they knew we're in trouble. We've got to pray. And no matter, listen, though the, everything was chaos around them and a storm was going on and everybody's crying out to their gods, Jonah's sleeping. Completely apathetic to the whole thing. He didn't care. He just sleeps. You know what happens when people are unwilling to serve God and you're not willing to do what God is telling you to do? You become, you'd rather sleep than pray. Well, they called out to God and asked Him to show them. And of course, Jonah told them, I'm the problem. And they do the straws that came on Jonah. He said, here's what you've got to do. You've got to throw me overboard. They didn't want to do that. I mean, it's a, it's a raging storm. We throw this guy in the sea, he's going to die. His blood will be on our hands. They were kind of conscientious about it, but finally he said, that's what you've got to do. And you know, it, I, I could just almost see their faces. They throw him in the water and everything stops. I'm sure they looked at each other and said, wow. <laughs> wow. I wonder if one of them might have said, why didn't we do that a long time ago? <laughs> <laughs> Could have saved all this stuff we threw overboard, huh? You know what happened? God sent that whale and he swallowed Jonah up. You know what the Bible says in the book of Jonah? Then Jonah prayed. Then Jonah prayed. Oh, now, now he's going to get with it. Now he's ready to be obedient. When God calls you to do a task, when God speaks to your heart about serving Him, don't tell Him no. I, I, I've, I've, I've been in church all my life. I was saved as a young boy. I cannot tell you how many thousands of sermons I've heard. I sat under some wonderful preachers through my years. I sat in the same church growing up as a youngster that Brother Yoder was part of and listened to Harold Henniger. I can't, I can't begin to tell you very many sermons that I remember from Dr. Henniger, but I do remember one. I do remember him making a statement saying you'll never get in trouble saying yes, Lord. You'll never get in trouble if you just say, yes, Lord. When you get in trouble is when you say no to God. Don't ever get in the habit of saying no to God. Don't ever say no to God. Say yes. When you, when you say no, you're not just being disobedient. You're robbing yourself of having an audience with God. You're robbing yourself of having prayers answered. God, God desires to use us. God desires to bless us. God desires to provide for us. God will enable us. David could take on Goliath because he knew God would help him. The three Hebrew children could go into the fiery furnace because they knew God could deliver them. 
Daniel at 85 years of age could go into the lion's den and know that, hey, it wasn't any physical strength that was going to deliver him. He knew God could deliver him. He knew God was able. I'd like you to look at John chapter 12 and verse 26 and we'll be, we'll be done. John 12 and verse number 26, please. An audience with God. <coughs> Excuse me. Notice what it says, Jesus speaking. If any man serve me, John 12 and verse 26, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my Father honor. God honors those who serve Him. Serve Jesus Christ with your life. Serve Jesus Christ with your life. Do you have an audience with God? Do you have an audience with God? Have you settled the salvation issue? Have you settled the sin issue? Have you settled your service issue? Then you're ready to have an audience with God. It is something essential we cannot live without. We must have that. It is mandatory. It is essential. The presence of God and being in His presence is not an optional thing. It's an absolute necessity. Someone said there's a lot of essentials in life. If you're going to make bread, you've got to have dough. If you're going to fly 30,000 feet above the ground, it's essential to have an airplane. If you're going to fish, you must have bait. If you're going to speak, you must have vocal cords. If you're going to think, you have to have a brain. If you're going to make a phone call, you've got to have a phone. If you're going to eat, you've got to have food. And if you're going to have the help of God, and if you're going to have the power of God, and you're going to have the, the provision of God, if you're going to have the presence of God, then listen, you have to have an audience with God. You have to be willing to spend time with Him. He's our water when we're thirsty. He's our bread when we're hungry. He's our rest when we're tired. He's our strength when we're weak. My friend, have an audience with God. I'm so glad I'm saved. I'm so glad that I've, I've, set, I've settled the sin issue. And I'm so glad that I've settled the service issue. You know why? Because I like having an audience with God. Don't you? If you don't, get one today. Settle these three issues. God said, Moses, I'm going to meet with the people, but they've, they've got to sanctify themselves. They've got, to, they've got to not come at their wives. They've got to wash their clothes. They've got to stay a certain distance. These are things they have to do for me to come down and meet with them. And God says, I want to meet with you. But first, you have to, you have to make sure you know Christ is your Savior. You have to settle salvation. You come to God by Him, by Jesus Christ. You have to settle the sin issue. Your sin will separate you from me. You have settled the service issue. If you're disobedient to me, if you're not doing what I've asked you to do, then I can't hear your prayer. I can't, I can't have an audience with you. So, so settle the salvation issue, the sin issue, and the service issue. And let's have an audience with God. Let's pray, shall we? Father, I pray you'll take the truth now this morning. Thank you, Lord, for desiring to want to have an audience with us. You're the God of the universe. Yet you desire that we draw near to you. You desire to meet with us. Forgive us, Lord, for at times allowing sin to be more important than us, to us than your presence, than having an audience with you. Forgive us, Lord, for wanting our way at times instead of Your way. When You call us and You impress upon us to do service for You and we tell You all the reasons why we can't do that. Forgive us, Lord. 
I pray, God, that this morning, if any in this room has never received Christ as their Savior, that today would be the day of salvation. They would come and call on the Lord Jesus and ask Him to be their Savior and receive His gift of eternal life. I pray, Lord, for those who've received that gift of eternal life and they're saved, that they've been regarding iniquity. They've been allowing sin to stay in their life. That they would confess and forsake it today and obtain Your mercy and have an audience with You. Maybe some today have refused to do what You're bidding them to do in their heart. Maybe it's a surrender to serve You with their life. Maybe someone is to go to the mission field. Maybe someone is to be in full-time service for You. Maybe someone just needs to be involved as a soul winner. Maybe there's some area of separation that someone's saying, no, Lord, I won't do that. Lord, forgive us for wanting our way instead of Your way. For wanting our will and not Your will. Oh, help us to be willing servants of Yours that we might have an audience with God. Lord, speak to hearts this morning, please. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. And then we'll have our invitation. I wonder how many folks in the room today would say, Pastor, I've settled the salvation issue. There's a time in my life when I prayed and I, I, from my heart, I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I mean, if you asked me if I died, would I go to heaven? I'd tell you yes. And the reason would be, I'm trusting Jesus Christ alone as my Savior. Pastor, that's my case today. I've settled the salvation issue. Here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up for a moment that I may see it? That's me, Pastor. All right, you may put it down. You're here today and would say, Pastor, I've, I've not settled the salvation issue. I'm not sure that I know Christ as my Savior. I appreciate you praying for me this morning. Would you slip your hand up and say, pray for me today? God bless you. Thank you. So somebody else would say, Pastor, pray for me. You couldn't raise it the first time, but you'll raise it this time. I'll not embarrass you at all, but I'll pray for you. I wonder how many believers here today would say, Pastor, I need to settle the sin question. I need to settle some sin issues in my life. Or maybe I need to settle some service issues in my life. I know there's some sin I not only have to confess, I need to forsake. And there's some things I know God's prompted me to do with my life that I've been telling Him all the reasons why I can't. I've been making excuses. But really, I'm just being disobedient. But Pastor, I, I'm willing to yield that to God. If He's prompted me to do it, He'll enable you to do it. He won't, he won't send you in your strength. He'll send you in His strength. You'll never get in trouble saying yes to God. I wonder how many believers here today would say, Preacher, God spoke to my heart today. Please pray for me this morning. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Yes. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment, I'm going to pray. We're going to have our invitation. If you are not certain about your salvation, when I'm done praying, we'll stand to our feet. The pianist will play. Brother Bob's going to sing. Christians will begin to respond. They'll come to the altar to pray. Yielding themselves to God. Making sure they can have an audience with Him. If you're here today and you've never received Christ as your Savior, you're not sure about that, why don't you come while they're coming to pray? We'll have someone who's been trained take a Bible. And they'll show you how you can know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Whatever it is that God has dealt with your heart about, respond to Him now this morning. Oh, don't, don't leave here today feeling far from God. He wants to have an audience with you. He wants to meet with you. Meet with Him. Have an audience with God today. Heavenly Father, bless this invitation time. 
I pray your will will be done in each life and each heart. Thank you for speaking to hearts this morning. I pray, Lord, that each one that you've spoken to would respond and listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit this morning and that each of them would say yes to you. And I'll thank you for what you'll do. Quietly with your heads bowed, would you stand to your feet? As you stand to your feet, our pianist plays as she plays. Bob is going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this morning, will you please? That's right. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all oh power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see. Christ only always living in me. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yield Father, we thank you now for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts through your word. Thank you for the Bible this morning. Thank you, Holy Spirit of God, for ministering to us today. Thank you for decisions that have been made for you this morning. I pray, Lord, that throughout this day today, as it's the Lord's day, we would take advantage of the tremendous opportunity and privilege to have an audience with God. We love you. We thank you, Lord, for desiring us to come into your presence. For in your presence is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. We love you this morning. Thank you for each one that's here in attendance today. Give us a good afternoon, and Lord, I pray you'll bring us back tonight for the evening service. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Brother Bob will lead us. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heads with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you tonight.